surprised. How many of the ladies, <laughs> whenever you saw this this transformation happening, you just did you did you feel it in your body? <laughs> no question. No, no question. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was Heather and her family. There were no other names that were given on the website. In her video, Twin Pregnancy, Watch Me Grow, from 2016, Heather was a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and after graduation, she moved to Japan to teach ESL and met her husband. They lived in Japan until 2011 and then moved to New York where they started their family. They had their first child in 2012 and if you noticed, he was the only child on that little whiteboard and were surprised with twins in 2015. Since then, she has become a blogger, a YouTuber with over 200 million channel views, a freelance social media manager, founder and publisher of a local publication, Bay Ridge Families, an ebook writer of legit ways to make money from home while minding your kids and not losing your mind, <laughs> acro yoga enthusiast, and founder and admin of several local Facebook groups, including Bay Ridge Baby Mamas, Bay Ridge Toddler Mamas, and Bay Ridge Kid Mamas. She has a website US, U.S. Japan Fam, that was up there on the screen, usjapanfam.com, which offers a little bit of everything for busy moms trying to navigate parenthood in the Western world. In her video, Twin Pregnancy Watch Me Grow went viral after being shown on headline news in 2016 with over 6 million views. Did anyone happen to see that video before? Oh, you've seen it. Oh, that, that, that's good. It's good. Well, I'm continuing our series in the Gospel of Luke today. And the second part of last week's message, which was a tale of two babies, this is part two. Now, chapter one of the Gospel of Luke contains what is known as the birth narratives. And last week, we talked about the birth of John the Baptist and this week, I want to look at the lead up to the birth of Jesus. And again, and this is the key, and this is what I've been encouraging us to do every week. How many of you watched the video that I put out on, on, on Facebook this past week? Did anybody? Okay. Well, there's a video that I put out on Facebook. And anyhow... I've been encouraging everyone, and, and, I, and, and this is also something that I'm trying to do, to make sure that when we read this story, to try to read it like it's the very first time, with a fresh set of eyes, to, to, to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us instead of just kind of just read over it, you know, like, yeah, I know what happens next. So let's read gospel, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 26. And let's read it like it was the first time. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and it will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Is anyone really ever ready to have a baby? Moms, 
Dads, are you ever really ready to have a baby? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You think you are. <laughs> yeah. There's something about whenever the ch the child decides to show up that plans seem to change. And if it's a surprise, it really changes things. Our son Chris just celebrated his 28th birthday on Friday. And as I was, was reading this week, I was thinking about what it was like when we were getting ready for him to be born. We found out that, that Danelle was expecting, see, we've been married, what, not even six months yet. And we were talking about it yesterday that we went from being newlyweds to getting ready to be parents. And then we were parents from that point on. And, and you, you just don't get that time back, you know, that you had early in marriage, you know? And we were talking about that, and then, then I, I started thinking about the things that happened the, the morning that, that our son was born. Um, it was kind of a funny story. Um, the, the day before he was born, we were, we were living in a, in a house that had a skylight, and it was a full moon, and then the, the thing about the full moon is true when it comes to the babies being born. I mean, it, it turns everything into chaos, and, and Deanna's shaking her head because, yeah, she knows. It gets crazy. <laughs> it, it, it gets crazy around the hospital. The hospital that we went to was packed, and, and, and there, were, there were people sitting out in wheelchairs waiting to get into a bed. There were that, just that many babies that were being born that day. Well, the, the day before Chris was born, we had the skylight, and the moon was in the skylight. Well... I'm sound asleep. Danelle had gotten up to go to the bathroom and she comes back to tell me that I should see the moon in the skylight. I thought this was the day and I jumped out of bed. Oh my goodness. And, and no, it, it, I was just telling you that the skylight in the, the moon. So the next day, whenever it was actually Chris's time to come, she comes in and, and, and tries to wake me. And I'm like, I don't want to hear about the moon. <laughs> no, it's time to go to the hospital. And then, you know, of course, then everything went crazy from there. <clears throat> but when a baby is born, it has a way, boy or girl, he or she, has a way of, of interrupting and changing our plans. I mean, we can do the best we can, but ultimately everything depends on, on what, what that baby decides to do. Well, if you can imagine this morning what it must have been like for Mary to find out that she was about to have a child. Scholars tell us that she was probably 14 or 15 years old, but she could have been younger. My grandmother, my paternal grandmother, she was 14 whenever she married my grandfather. And, you know, and in, in, in back in those days, that wasn't that odd. Nowadays, it's like 14 years old, uh, uh, I think you need to wait. But she was 14 or 15 years old, and she was already engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. We don't get an indication of how old Joseph is, but we, we find out later that it appears that Joseph has already passed, so he must have been a little bit older than Mary by, by some extent. The fact that he was, he was already had his own trade is a pretty good indication that he was probably a grown man by the time that he and Mary had gotten engaged to each other. Luke also mentions that he was part of the line of David. Now, at this point in time, the dynasty that was David's line, it was still there. They were able to trace it, but there wasn't really the esteem that was, was there for the family. I mean, there was, there was no, they weren't rich, but they, they had the distinction of being in the descendancy of, of the king of Israel. Now, we don't know where Mary and Joseph were in their plans to get married, but everything... Once she met with the angel, everything changed 
dramatically. And it's interesting when you look at, at Luke chapter 1, Luke tells this story almost in a, in a comparison contrast. Whenever we, we talk about Zechariah, we talked about him last week, that he encountered the, the angel Gabriel. And then Mary encounters Gabriel. Just really just a few days apart from, from, from when, it, when all this, this happened. And he tells the story to compare what Zechariah did and what Mary did. And so I, I just in, in a way of, of comparison and contrast, John's family, Zechariah's family, descended from the priestly line of Aaron. I said last week that that was one of the most esteemed lines in all of Israel. To be from a, a, a priestly line, that, that was one of the, the best things that you could have in the community. Well, Jesus and Joseph Mary descended from the line of David. So there's, there's that, that contrast. Zechariah and Elizabeth lived in Judea, which is the region where Jer Jerusalem was. This is where, if you were Jewish, you wanted to live because God lived in Jerusalem. Mary lived in Nazareth. It was the region outside of Judea it was a region that was that was filled with a lot of Gentiles. And if anyone wanted to worship the true God, if you were Jewish, you had to go to Jerusalem to do it. So being born in, 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 in Nazareth wasn't really, it wasn't all that great. Zechariah and Elizabeth were what they called old. I heard this week, and, and this, this kind of blew my mind. It might blow your mind too. They were, they, and, and you can read it in Luke. It says that they were old. There's a scholar that says that they were probably only 40 or 50 years old whenever they were being told that they couldn't have any children. Now, you know, that, that is kind of old to be having children. I mean, let, let's be honest. Uh, who, who would want to be a, a, a parent at a point where you're probably going to have grandkids? Not too many people. But the fact that they were considered to be old, and by comparison, Mary was considered to be young. 14, 15. And it's interesting that whenever Gabriel appears to Zechariah and Mary, he just shows up. Whenever Zechariah is in the holy place, right? He's just standing there. Whenever Mary encounters Gabriel, he tells her, you're a favored woman. The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid. And there's a reason for that, and I'm going to get to that here in just a second. And most notably, when you look at the comparison, Gabriel pretty much says the same thing to Zechariah that he says to Mary. And their answers almost appear to be the same. But Zechariah is struck mute and is unable to speak until John is born. And then he tells Mary that she will be blessed. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, Zechariah was a priest. He was a married man. He spent his entire adult life in the service of God in the temple. And he came face to face with an angel. And he doubted his words. <clears throat> and seemed to want another sign. Well, how can I know that your words are true? And the angel said, well, you're going to be, going to be mute. This will give you time to think about it. And then, then you'll see that your son will be born in due time. Mary was a virgin. She had never been with a man. 
And her her response when you read it in the in in the original the original language, it seems to say, "When will this happen?" Or it can't happen yet because I'm still a virgin and I'm not married, but I will be. Just give me a minute. <laughs> and she likely could have thought that that the Messiah could have come through her, her union with her soon-to-be husband. So, in essence, she's like, absolutely, yes. When, when, when's this going to happen? And then Gabriel goes on to describe how Jesus would be conceived by the Holy Spirit in her life. There, there's a big fancy word in, 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 in biblical scholarship that's called incarnation. That means that, that, that God takes on flesh, that he becomes a man. And so in, in this, this act of conception, however, he, he describes how the Holy Spirit will hover over her and, and that he will shadow over her. And what is conceived in her will be holy. It didn't come from the natural union of man and woman, that it's God in, 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 a, in an immaculate conception, as, it, as it's called. And then he told her that Elizabeth, her cousin, that's what the King James Version, King, King James Version says. All the other translations say it's a close relative. And, and there, there was some stuff like the, they kind of used the term cousin kind of loosely. And, and, and there's some, some external information that, that'll, that says that how they were related. We really don't see that in Scripture. We just know that there's, there's some kind of relationship. And it's the kind of relationship that whenever she gets this news, that she, she goes to see Elizabeth. And we'll get to that here in just a second, too. But all of these things would be a sign to Mary that Gabriel's words to her could be trusted. And then after he, he drops this on her, he leaves. Now, I want you to see something here. This is the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And one of the things I said during our, our introduction a couple of weeks ago, the things that you will see in Luke's Gospel that are unique from all the others is how prominent women are in this story. And if you know in classic storytelling, you usually tell the story with the most important characters up front. And who have we heard from so far? We've heard from Zechariah, heard from Elizabeth, we've heard from Mary. And the thing about, about Mary is that she's an unknown Jewish girl. And she responded to God's word to her with faith. 14, 15 years old entrusting her life to God. Um, and never mind the fact that, that she could be scandalized if she's found to be with child and she's not married. How do you explain, well, this is, this is God's baby? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. You know, we, we've heard that before. Um, it would, they really haven't, but um, but she found herself at the center of this story of good news. Can you imagine a fourteen or fifteen year old girl? She's at the center of this story. So Luke continues in verse thirty nine. He says, "A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country." to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her. Ladies, have you ever had your baby to leap inside of you? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was funny whenever Chris was born. You could see him gyrating sometimes. 
you know, especially whenever he, he got farther along. Hey, I, I, I felt for Daniel. Um, there, there's really no way to sympathize as a guy. I'm sorry. But Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And Elizabeth gave a glad cry and, and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you among, above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Isn't that amazing? Now, I'd also like to point this out. The first person on earth to recognize the Son of God was an unborn baby. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And that baby would grow up to be John the Baptist. <coughs> An unborn child responded to the presence of Jesus. Now, when we read Luke's gospel, we're drawn to the character of Mary. But she represents a, a, a problem, really, for us in, in biblical history. Some traditions have focused on her too highly and, and too heavily to the point that she's been, been raised to a place in the story where she was never intended to be. Well, on the other hand, those of us from more Protestant traditions, we've tried not to, to elevate her, and in a sense, we've almost neglected her place in the story. In this story of two babies, there is no Jesus without Mary. And we need to remember that as we as we look at our, our our nativity scenes and as we as we move into the Christmas celebration. And I also want to point out that Mary was an exceptional woman of faith and character, which is why God chose her to be the mother of Jesus. But she was also a woman who had knowledge. Of scripture. Now, wait a minute, Joel. How can that be? In the first century, women didn't have access to the synagogue. They didn't have access to, to be taught by the rabbis. Yet somehow, Mary has a grasp of the, of the history of scripture. And you see it in the Magnificat. Whenever she's praising the Lord, Verse 46, my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows his mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. That song, it's reminiscent of another song. You might remember the story of, of Hannah in the Old Testament. She was the one, she, she was married to a man who had another wife, and, the, and that other wife was, was blessed with children, and she was barren. And she went before the Lord and begged the Lord to hear her prayer. And she goes to the temple, and the priest, Eli, thinks that she's drunk, but she is just so sad because she's not had any children. And she's cried before God. And Eli, you know, just trying to be a nice guy, just said, well, may the Lord grant your request. And she conceives a child and has the baby Samuel. She dedicates him to the Lord and brings him into the temple so he can be raised in the temple. Now, those of you with small children, please don't bring your kids to church. To, for us to raise them. But somehow, 
somehow Samuel was raised in the temple and he began to hear the, the voice of God from a very early age and became one of the greatest prophets and priests that Israel ever knew. Well, his mother, whenever she found out that she was pregnant with Samuel, also sang a song that went like this. My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have, I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one beside you. There is no rock like our God. He will protect his faithful ones in verse 9. But the wicked will disappear in darkness. And no one will succeed by strength alone. Do you see the, the, the comparison? You see the likeness of the two songs? So somehow, Mary, along the way, Perhaps it was the fact that she was from David's family, that she somehow got herself in a place where she could hear the word, where she could be taught, where she could somehow overhear someone teaching, and she gained knowledge of Scripture. In other words, she positioned herself to be available and to be used by God in her life. Now, those of you who were here when we were going through the, the disciplines, the spiritual practices of the Christian life, you remember that? The, the whole purpose for doing that is to put us in a place where God can speak to us, where he can use us, where he can, he can work in us, and he can make his transformation take place inside of us. You know, that's why, that's why we read Scripture. That's why we practice prayer. That's why we... We practice celebration. That's why we, we practice things like solitude, so that we can get alone and hear the voice of God. Somehow along the way, we don't know how, Scripture doesn't tell us, but somehow Mary had positioned herself to be the one that God chose to be the mother of Jesus. It's a wonderful story. But I think the words that best characterize Mary in Scripture is from Luke chapter 1, verse 38. And it's her response that she gave to Gabriel before he left her. She said, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. I don't know about you, but... Whenever that, that time comes that, that, that I feel like God is leading me to do something, that I would respond like Mary. I'm the Lord's servant. Whatever it is, whatever that might be, whatever that might look like, that I would get past my fear, that I would get past myself, that I would get past whatever it might be that would get in the way of me responding to the word of the Lord, and that I would be able to say, I'm your servant. Use me, do with me as you will. And I, that's my prayer for us as a congregation, that we would do the same. Can we stand together this morning? There are a, a few things that I, I feel like that I think the Lord might want to want to to do here this morning. First of all, if you're in a place and you've never made a decision for Jesus, you've never made a commitment. You maybe you've been associated with church, or you've you know you've had you come from a, a Christian home, or you, you have friends who are Christians, but you've never made a decision for Jesus. I think nothing could be better for the Christmas season than to make that decision and say that you'll follow him the rest of your life. During this season that we celebrate, 
God coming to us, God with us, in the terms of, of Jesus, the Son of God coming to us. So if if you if you'd like like to make that decision, I, I I hope that you would be willing to do that today and, and that we'll have some folks here to, to pray with you if you if you'd like to do that here in just a minute. I also feel like that there, there's some that are here today that you're faced with some difficult circumstances and you're not really sure quite what to do. And, and maybe hearing this story about Mary has encouraged you to the point like, I, I, I think I know what God wants me to do, but I, I need the courage to say yes. Well, if, if that's you, I, I, I would like for you to come forward for prayer this morning. And I also would like to just invite anyone, if you would like to put yourself in a place to receive God's blessing in your life. You feel like that, you know, for whatever reason, things haven't been going the way you want them to. And I, I'd like to get in a place where I could receive God's blessing for me. To find out what God wants to do in my life. If that's the case, I'd also invite you to come get prayer. And finally, if you're here this morning and you are feeling pain in your body, this is one of the things that, that, we, that, that, that we try to be faithful to, that we, we believe the kingdom of God breaks in and that we can experience the healing of the future in our bodies now. That's not to say that it's that it, it's perfect. That's not to say that everything is is made completely well, but the kingdom breaks in and and things change. Things happen. And if you're experiencing pain in your body and you'd like someone to pray for you, and maybe you've asked before and nothing's happened, but you're still in pain, and this could be the day that the kingdom breaks in. So if you'd like to receive prayer, I'd like to invite you to come forward for that. So I'm, I'm going to say a, a, just a general prayer. And, and I, I say this every week. So this, this is a dismissal. If you need to go, you're free to go. If you would like to receive prayer, please stick around. And those of you who are on the prayer team, if you would, come and join me here in the front. We just want the, an opportunity to pray with you and, and, and bless you this morning. So if you, if you need prayer, please come forward today, okay? Dear Jesus, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We know, Lord, that you love us. We know that you love us because you give us this story of life and hope. And you want to demonstrate to us that you are with us and that you are you are mindful of everything that we go through. And Lord, I ask as we go this week that your hand would be with us and that you would guide us and that you would allow us to open ourselves to receive from you the things that you want us to receive. We give you all glory and praise today. and It's in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you like prayer, I want to invite you to come to the front.